Hello, and good morning. Welcome to our service of worship. If you're, uh, if you're watching online, we are glad you're here. If you are here new, I saw some new people this morning, met some new people this morning. So uh, we thank you for coming. Um, I'm Dave, and we are the Pathfinder Praise and Worship team, and it's our privilege to bring worship music to you today. So um, we're so glad you're here. We're going to have a great service this morning. Um, if you would please stand and worship with us, we're going to sing a song called Control. Are you in control of your own life? Who's in control? Control was an illusion. Control? Yeah, I, know. I thought I was. I thought I was, and I fell asleep at the wheel. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. All right. Can you see? Over me? You got taller. You got taller, huh?
that frees me to take my hands off my life and away it should go. You may be seated. It's the Marcus and Jerry show. All right. That's a good one. Are you ready? Are you ready? Come on up. Hey, I want to show you something up here. It's way up in the rafters of the church. Literally, I see it's hung from the ceiling. Look at this. What do you suppose this is? A beautiful shirt. Why is it beautiful? Because it has all the colors. You know, there's a guy in the, the Bible. His name is Joseph. You know that book? Yeah, it's in the book of Genesis. And his name is Joseph. And his daddy loved him so much that he gave him a beautiful shirt. You know the problem with that? Oh my gosh, he knows the story better than many of us sitting here today. He says his brothers took away the shirt and put animal blood on it so that his daddy would think what? That they killed, well, that not they, they wanted to blame a lion. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my. So that's, but now look, there's something on the front of that beautiful shirt. What is it? The numbers. The numbers. Marilyn, what do those numbers mean? They mean prison. Oh, 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 so there's not like BR549, call Junior Samples and get, get a great deal on a used car? No. <laughs> so you just randomly pick those? No, it's the Bible part of your, it's one of your Bible verses. <laughs> I got to tell you, I've read the Bible cover to cover more than a few times and I've never seen verse 412,528. Try 41, 25, 28, is it? Oh, okay. See, there you go. And now you guys have been schooled in numerology. Come on down. So we have this snowballs. That's exactly right. Wait, wait, wait. Don't touch the snowballs. They're just to look at. You sound disappointed. You are. Why are you dis What did you want to do with the snowballs? You wanted to do a snowball fight. Why would you want to do that? Because it's like 40 below zero in Florida? <laughs> it is cool playing with those. So when you wanted it, and I said, stop, you stopped. Why did you do that? You don't know. Mom and grandma are doing a good job with you. I want to tell you right now. Because sometimes when God tells us to stop, we don't stop. And we keep doing what we shouldn't do. That's one of the lessons that God taught the guy who wore that shirt. He taught him that through all kinds of difficult, difficult situations. But Joseph always obeyed God. So I want to tell you what. When at the end of the day, God was able to use Joseph to feed his family when they were starving to death. But if he hadn't obeyed God... At any one of those testing points throughout his life, 23 years from the time he dreamed to the time God fulfilled his dream, Joseph obeyed even when it was hard. So that's what I want you to do, is as you grow, hear the voice of God and obey. And then guess what happens? You get to have a snowball fight. <laughs> here, here. I tell you what, how far can you throw it? Oh! Oh, oh, now you're talking. One more. Oh. <laughs> Let's give Marcus a hand. 
All right. Can we pray? You ready to pray? Dear God, thank you so much for loving me enough to make me special. Help me make you special in my life by obeying. Amen. All right, Marcus, have a great day, guys. Thanks, man. You always make my worship. That preacher's a little long and dry, but you make it worth coming. <laughs> oh, you didn't want to add to your collection? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and the warmth in our lives that you provide. Thank you for your love. We are nothing without you. We know you work all things together for our good. Being in a pit, sold into servitude, being accused of things we didn't do. You use these things to prepare us for your plans. Thank you for your word and help us to understand what you are trying to say to us. We thank you for Jesus, who died for our sins, and is our friend and savior forever, and gave us our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is a song by Jeremy Camp. This is called Overcome. Wayne's going to lead the dance. And I am not C. I can tell. I am C now. <laughs> C? All right. Okay. to die hold up for all mankind God's only son perfect and spotless one He never sinned suffered as if he Yeah. 
I'd like you to, I'd like you to stand and worship with us, and clapping is going to be important. You'll see where. Yeah, just like Jerry's going to do. Jerry will lead you in the clapping. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> this is called "Eye of the Storm." It's written by Ryan Stevenson, and it really um, just talks about who you can rely on when things get really bad. And you don't know where to turn. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of a war, you guide my soul. You alone are the anchor. Are you in the right key? Are you? In the eye of the storm, there you go. You remain in control. In the middle of a war, you guide my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. All right, put your hands together. When the solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet, between the black sky and the I can barely see When I realize I've been sold out by my friends and family I can feel the rain reminding me In the eye of the storm You remain in control In the middle of a war You guide my soul You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn Your love surrounds me In the eye of the storm When my hopes and dreams are far from me And I'm running out of faith I see the future, I picture Slowly fade away When the tears of pain and heartache Pouring down my face I find my peace in Jesus' name In the eye of the storm You remain in control yes. In the middle of a war You guard my soul You alone are the anchor When my sails are torn Your love surrounds me In the eye of the 
Like a bitter pill I'm swallowing, I can barely take a breath. When addiction steals my baby girl, there's nothing I can do. My only hope is to trust in you. I trust in you, Lord, in the eye of the storm. You remain in control in the middle of a war. You got my soul. Alone on the anchor, while my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. You remain in control in the middle of a war. You guide my soul. You alone on the anchor, while my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me. In the eye of the storm, 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 in the eye of the storm. All right. Right. I hear. I see. You knew that one. I did you know do that, that song. I did. <laughs> I was uh, glad to hear it. Right. I've got so many friends here in this faith community and around the world, literally, that are struggling because they are in the eye of the storm. You know what? This thing is like... <laughs> Just in case somebody super glued this to have this moment, I am going to trade this one away. They're no good? No worky. No worky? Oh, that's the. Uh, that's the. That's that's, the, that's for that's the somebody. Else. One. Yes, I was gonna say that's not really my it's my the height, height challenge. Thanks. <laughs> Jeez, I'm so glad I didn't pull the top of that off. <laughs> I remember the first time I helped uh, Lisa's family's uh, uh, take out the docks up at Lake George, and uh, you know you're you're there and you don't want to look like a wimp in front of your brother-in-laws, <laughs> and it was a little stuck. I got to admit, in the muck of the lake, and so I just hefted for all I was work, pop the weld. <laughs> I've never lived it down, okay? I paid to have it fixed, and still, I'm the guy who broke the dock, okay? That's all right, Lisa's the one who crashed into the dock. <laughs> At least I don't have that one to carry around. Uh, today we have a, uh, a new uh, uh, and somewhat short-lived ministry. Uh, Marjorie uh, Jordan is here with us from up north. Uh, well... Miko, <laughs> and uh, she is going to, she is a nurse, and she is going to be giving free blood pressure checks in the cafe between services and after the second service. So if you're curious what your blood pressure is, you know what would be a really great experiment is to get your blood pressure before you came to church, <laughs> and then after the service, see if this makes any difference at all in your life, okay? Uh, but Marjorie will be taking blood pressures, and I'm really excited about that, so. Um, well, welcome to week four of ten in our series called, do you remember? His story. Right, God's story. We're, we're looking at ten Old Testament stories and how they fit into John 5.39. Could you put that on the screen for me? Read it with me. You search the scriptures because you believe they give you eternal life. Now, wait a minute. Uh, the scriptures that John would have been talking about, were they the New Testament, the Old Testament, or both? Actually, the Old Testament. The New Testament had not yet been written. So he's saying, you are looking for God, and you're looking the right place. But you've got to look for not just the right place, you've got to look for the right face. He says, you search the scriptures because you believe they give you eternal life. Finish it with me, would you? But the scriptures point to me, and who said that? Jesus, whose birth we celebrate, whose life we remember by learning to obey his teachings. 
and whose death and resurrection makes all the difference in the world, in the next world, because he will come again. That is the promise, the mystery of faith that the Christian community has been charged with proclaiming. Last week, we looked at Father Abraham. Do you remember the story? Abraham was given a great gift, a son that he grew to love more than who? God. And then the, the primary way I like to teach that, and I use it all the time, is your life is like a, a bicycle wheel, right? You remember that illustration? And then what's supposed to be in the center? God. And so there's all kinds of beautiful spokes, family, friends, career, health, wealth, all these beautiful things God gives us to kind of fill out life. But if we take any one of those things or any person and we put in the middle, uh, it's not just harmful for us, it's harmful for others. If you put somebody on a pedestal, what end up, ends up happening? They fall off the pedestal. And then you get mad or, or maybe they die or maybe your, your health or your wealth disappears and suddenly you feel like you can't go on. Your life has been diminished. We just sang about that in the eye of the storm. Uh, Christ is meant to be in the eye of your life. He's meant to be the center. That is the place for strength in this life and in the life to come. Uh, these Old Testament stories that we're going through beg the question, how does God speak to us? Because when you read the Bible, very clearly, we have this sense of a conversation going on between heaven's throne and the people in the throes of life, just like you and me. So how does God speak to us. Read this with me out of Job. Anybody familiar with the book of Job? Anybody writing a new chapter in the book of Job where it just seems like the wheels are falling off your life? You're in the eye of the storm. In the eye of the storm, oftentimes we can hear the God that's been speaking to us since he wonderfully and feared, fearfully pulled us together in our mother's womb. Read it with me, would you? God does speak. Read that again. God does speak. Do you believe it? He is speaking to you right now, okay? God to speak now one way, now another, though man may not perceive it. Are you perceiving the fact that God is talking to you? The Bible assures us that if we don't worship God, even the rocks will cry out. Uh, all of creation shouts the glory of the present God. So why don't you join the chorus? So how does he do it? Read it with me. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on man as they slumber in their beds. Today we're going to look at Abraham's great-grandson. What's his name? I'm so appreciative of Marcus. He gave us a chance to preview the, the, that story. <laughs> and I, I'm glad that I now understand what the prison number means. I was a little concerned because, you know, Freud says that once in a while numbers mean something. And I was kind of curious what that meant to Marilyn, and now I know. She's uh, way ahead of her preacher, that's for sure. Uh, so we're going to look at Abraham's great-grandson, Joseph. His are the first dreams recorded in your Bible. In one dream, he dreams that his brothers will bow down to him. And in another dream, not just his brothers, but his father will also bow down. Uh, do you think that caused a little strife, a little family dysfunction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, uh, he uh, was uh, kind of arrogant about this. Not just the coat of many colors, but his dreams. How many of you believe that you dream? There are some people that cannot recall a single dream. But the truth is we all dream. And you go, well, Jerry, that's crazy. If you can't remember them, you're still having them. Uh, Freud believed that dreams reveal our hidden desires. And once in a while, I've had those dreams, and I go, oh, Really? I hate chocolate. Why would I dream about a chocolate cake? For you, that's a dream. For me, that's a nightmare, okay? Uh, Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory? Oh my God, I experienced that. My cousin said it'd be funny to take me to Hershey, Pennsylvania to the amusement park. <laughs> Nothing amusing about it. I stayed in the car throwing up and they didn't leave early. Cindy, Chris, if you're watching, it's on you. Just say, all right. So, but we all dream. Carl Jung believed that dreams somehow integrate our conscious and our unconscious minds. And the most vivid dreams happen not in a daydream, but in the deepest kind of sleep. What is that called? REM, rapid eye movement sleep. And the Bible supports that. While men are fast asleep in our beds. We don't recall an estimated 90% of what we dream. So for those of you who say, I can't even get the last 10, 
that's okay. Uh, this reality that we don't remember most of our dreams has led to this uh, modern idea that dreaming is sort of like a data dump. You know, everything is based on the science of the particular generation. We're big in the computers this generation. And in a data dump, uh, you take all the information that's no longer necessary in the core of the machine and you just get rid of it. You purge it. Uh, anybody ever have to uh, do something with a hard drive where you had to clean off some files so you have more room for some good stuff? Or your phone? St. Lisa did that with our old phone quite a bit. Honey, really, you don't have to take 10 pictures of one butterfly. <laughs> And I'm cheap, I realize. I finally bought her a phone that has more memory, but you know, whatever. Um, but here's the deal. One of the ideas that sprung out of this uh, idea or this reality, we only remember uh, about 10% of our dreams, is that maybe dreaming is like a, allows us to erase the whiteboard of our memory so that we can fill it up with some new and more relevant things. So dreaming gives us permission to release the hopes, the fears, the aspirations that we had before. Uh, now, recurring dreams is something else. I'm not a dream analyst, but recurring dreams are powerful. Maybe you do really dream to forget, to forget who you are, to forget your limitations, and to be able to allow your finite mind to be invaded by the infinite God. What if God writes his thoughts on our dreams? You just read a scripture that says that part of the Bible believes that. Read it with me, would you? Acts 2.16. What you see was predicted centuries ago by the prophet Joel. Now Peter is speaking. The people gathered there in Jerusalem. Okay. So what you see, people are being filled with the Spirit. Some people think they're drunk. And he says, it's not even 9 o'clock in the morning yet. And I'm thinking... You don't know Key West, okay? Uh, he says, in the last days, read it with me, would you? God will pour out his spirit upon all people. Are you included in all people? Yes, yes, you are. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. In other words, hear God's voice and share that voice with the world. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. I believe we are in the end times. It was certainly inaugurated with the birth of the Christ. He ushered in the last age. He began the last age with coming in a manger, but he'll end this age when the trumpet of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and those that are living in Christ will be lifted up and join him in the air. I believe that day is much closer today than it's ever been in the history of humanity. Now, one of the ways we dream is by meditating on what God says in his scripture about the future. The best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. If God is truly speaking through visions and dreams, that's exactly what happened to the men and women whose dreams and hopes and fears are recorded in the pages of your Bible. So why not become familiar with the way God talks to us in those moments when we let our guard down, in those moments where what seems impossible to us in our waking rational mind, but are perfectly within God's capability. So in your dream state, listen for God and his vision for your life. So meditate on God's word. You can run with people like the prophet Joel. You can run with people like Joseph, and experience their dreams vicariously and ask yourself, is God trying to speak to me today? Now, they've run their races, and their dreams are recorded here. That's why it's so important to read not just the New, but the Old Testament, to, to understand not just the understandings of a preacher or a teacher, but in fact, to get in there and let God speak to you. Open the word yourself. And before you begin to study, say, Holy Spirit, open my heart, open my mind. I want to see what God wants to show me. And you'll be amazed at how much God wants to show you that you're not yet ready to see. John Maxwell is a great church. He was a Nazarene pastor, Skyline uh, Nazarene Church out on the West Coast, one of the largest only megachurches in the Nazarene Connection. Um, and a great teacher. He teaches leadership 
in corporate America as well as in the church. He wrote a book called Running with the Giants. Running with the Giants. And he said in that book, we need what these men and women have to offer. He's talking about those whose stories, whose dreams are recorded in the Bible because the race you and I are running today has an eternal impact. So run with the giants for a while to receive their inspiration, their wisdom, and empowerment. Believe it or not, you're the first person to live life. Believe it or not, you're not the first person to face adversity or temptation. Believe it or not, you're not the first person to have fears or doubts. Wouldn't it be better to go through the school of hard knocks having given, been given advanced warning, having been given a protocol, a method to the madness called life? Dreams. Your dreams face adversity. They face the issues of attraction and the issues of authority. Uh, God gave Joseph not only his dreams, but the ability to interpret dreams. His dreams began in the dusty fields of Palestine or Canaan and are fulfilled where? In the palace halls of who? The king of Egypt is called Pharaoh. In between those two moments in his life were doubts and difficulties and delays. Anybody here ever experience a doubt? How about a delay? Don't those irritate the fool out of you, especially on I-75? Oh, my gosh. And, of course, we've all experienced difficulty. This should be easier than this, but it's not. So what do you do? Like Joseph, each of us faces three tests on the way to our dream which I hope fits into God's bigger dream. Those three tests are right at the top. Read them with me, would you? Adversity, attraction, and authority. Let's talk about the test of adversity. Um, Joseph was 17 when God whispered the future into his dreams. And his family didn't respond very well. You know, they just didn't. Kind of like the new pastor asked to lead a a struggling church into a brighter future. It's the way you share it. And Joseph was 17. He didn't share it very well. Uh, But God knew that for his promise to Abraham to come true, that he would have be the father of many nations, he would have descendants more numerous than the stars in the sky and sands on the beach. He knew knew that to happen, uh, there was a big bump coming in the road called life, and it was going to be a huge famine. And so he looked around and he found Joseph a dreamer. And then he gave him a dream that would take 23 years to fulfill. And Joseph, read it with me, would you? When Joseph told his father and brothers, his father Jacob rebuked him. What is this dream you've had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down before you? Oh, come on, let's be, let's be real here. Joseph was young, 17. He was immature, and so God helped him grow up. God helped him become the instrument of salvation. Joseph was misunderstood by his family and sold into slavery. You remember this story, don't you? If you don't, get into Genesis and read it for yourself. It's an interesting story. It's one of the stories that got my son, at about eight or nine years old, interested back into doing Bible study with his daddy. He was sold into slavery and shipped off to where? Egypt. That seems like a dead end if you're from Palestine. Uh, And in in Egypt, uh, God was with him, right? You know, he he found a job right away with who? Well, no, Potiphar or Potiphar. I don't, doesn't matter to me how you pronounce it. None of us are Egyptian. We can get away with whatever we want. So Potiphar uh, was a big wig in the uh, Pharaoh's regime. And so he was taken in and pretty soon... Uh, His gifts, graces, the blessing, the anointing of God is obvious to everyone, and so he puts him in charge of his whole household. Well, somebody took notes of him. Do you remember who? Potiphar's wife. So not only had he been maligned at home, he was now being maligned here in Egypt. And in fact, one day she cries, rape, even though there was no rape. And he's thrown into prison where he was promptly what? forgotten for two years. He was forgotten. He's languishing in prison. 
Now, how would you feel if you had lived a godly life, maybe a little arrogant, maybe made some small mistakes along the way, and through no fault of your own, uh, through a, a series of unfortunate incidents, you end up in prison, would you think God was with you or against you? Against you. So it would be strange for Joseph to feel anything except that. But here's the deal. Joseph didn't give up on his dream or God's dream. And here's why. Thought we had this worked out. Did you turn me off? Did I turn me off? Oh, and now we're going too fast. All right. So uh, Genesis 22.2. I want you to read just the first part, the part that is in yellow. You got it? So you ready? One, two, three. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. Okay. Moving along in the story. While Joseph was in prison, read it with me. The Lord was with him. And the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Do you get the message? And it's not just Joseph. Joseph was his daddy's favorite, but he's not God's favorite. God doesn't play favorites. You have the exact same opportunity to experience the blessing, the anointing of God that Joseph did. God is with you. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is with us. That's the whole point of Emmanuel. That's what it means. God is with us. Jesus, the Christ, and when he left, he sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of us so that God isn't just with us out here, beside us, God is with us in here. God uses, hear this, especially my friends that are in the eye of the storm right now, God uses adversity to refine our dreams and to align them with his dream. Many times we don't see why we're going through the valley. Many times we don't understand the issues that we're facing. I love that old saw about uh, life is really sort of like needlepoint. Uh, from the underside, you see all the knots and the twists and the crazy runs where you had to get grain from here to there. But on the top side, you see nothing but a beautiful tapestry. Your life is a beautiful tapestry from heaven's perspective, even though it seems to be a tangled mess of knots down here. God uses adversity to refine our dreams and to connect them in the fulfilling of his dreams. That's what this story about Joseph really means. When you're in the pit, when you're maligned or misunderstood, when your health is failing, allow that adversity to make you better, not bitter. It will change you. Choose to change in the direction of heaven. It's like the old story about the mule who fell into a pit on the farm one day and the farmer looked at him down in the pit and says, you know what, old Joe's not worth the trouble. So he just grabbed a shovel and threw a shovel full of dirt in on old Joe. Old Joe, sitting down there at the bottom of that pit, just shook it off and stepped up on top of that dirt. Well, the farmer just didn't pay any attention. He just kept shoveling dirt one shovel full at a time. But every time that dirt would hit his back, what did old Joe do? shook it off and stepped up. Well, pretty soon, he shook it off and stepped up and stepped right out of that pit, all right? That's what God intends for you to do. He doesn't want you to be knocked down. He doesn't want the wind knocked out of you. He doesn't want your faith destroyed. He wants your faith strengthened by the adversity that you will face in your life. Because the dreams that you have for you and for your loved ones, the dream that God has for all of us will face adversity. Shake it off and step up, looking up to the one who will never, ever stop loving or believing in you, even when you can't believe in God. So that's the first test, the first test of adversity. The second test is the test of attraction. Emily Dickinson said, uh, the heart wants what it wants. Now, Selena Gomez turned that into a hit fairly recently, but it was Emily Dickinson who said it. The truth is, we have wants, needs, and desires. That's part of what makes us human, all right? And those wants, needs, and desires create an attraction in us for something or someone else. Uh, sexual attraction is probably as strong as the urge to survive. Like adversity, attraction is both a test and a temptation. The temptation of adversity is to give up. The temptation 
of attraction is to give in. Joseph was a slave living in a a far country, alone with a powerful, attractive, and assertive woman. She wanted Joseph. Now listen to me. Satan does not appear as a little red devil with a pitchfork and horns on his head. (laughs) Temptation is usually beautiful. And temptation grooms us. It grooms us to step a little bit closer to the line, a little bit closer to the line, a little bit closer to the line until the heat is turned up so much that you're faced with a either-or choice, a choice to step across the line of temptation into sin or a choice to back up and run away. This is the way the test of attraction really works. Read it with me, would you? Potiphar's wife kept putting pressure on Joseph Day after day. Isn't it funny? If temptation was one and done, most of us could withstand it. (laughs) The things you want seem to pop up quite a bit, don't they? So, uh, but he refused to sleep with her, and he kept out of her way as much as possible. Right there, if you you struggle, honestly, with a temptation, it doesn't matter what area of your life, cut this verse out. Put it on your mirror in your bedroom. Put it on the mirror in your car. Why the mirror? Because you need to look at it, see your eyes. The eyes are the window to the soul and honestly understand what God is saying to you today through the response of Joseph then. You see, Joseph did the right things. He avoided being alone with temptation. He he looked at the cost, not just the promise that temptation was making. And finally, when trapped, instead of stepping over that line, he fled. In all seriousness, whatever that temptation is that's come to your mind this morning, maybe it's like Krispy Kreme donuts. It's like the pastor who used to drive to church every day and had to uh, go in front of a Krispy Kreme donut shop. And he he decided one day that he wasn't going to give in. So he prayed to the Lord, Lord, if there's not a parking spot open right in front of the donut shop, I'll just drive on to church. He gets to church with a box of Krispy Kreme donuts. And his assistant says, what's up? I thought you told me you'd given those up. He said, well, here's the prayer I prayed, he told her. And they said, and you know what? It only took 10 times around the block for a spot to open up. (laughs) Temptation is persistent. Can you be consistent in doing the right things like Joseph did? What guardrails do you have around your temptations? Look to this verse and find a template for resisting the devil. If you resist the devil, he will flee from you. That means you've learned to master your temptation. You see, desire is not a sin. It becomes sin when we gratify legitimate desires through illegitimate means. Now listen to me. Joseph aced aced the test of adversity and attraction. The truth is most of us don't. That's why we have a God of grace who sent his son, Jesus the Christ, to die for us on Calvary's Calvary's cross. He knows that we don't always get it right. And if we confess any sin, God is faithful and just and will forgive us from that sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Some of you pray over and over for a thing that you did, a line you crossed years and years ago. And what you're not listening to is God saying, What? See, the Bible says that when God forgives our sin, he forgets it. So you're trying to remind God of something he already forgot. Trust God, that is faith. I distinctly remember asking forgiveness for that sin. Now, if you sin again in that direction, confess again. But trust that God is faithful and just and will forgive you of any unrighteousness. So Joseph did good on these first two tests test of adversity and the test of attraction, but now comes the really, really hard test, the test of authority. Abraham Lincoln said these words, just listen. Nearly all men and women can stand adversity, but if you want to test someone's character, give them what? Power. A little power in the hands of a little man is a big problem. And you know this to be true. Doesn't matter whether it's in the school system, at work, 
in the church, PTO, uh, little people who grab a little bit of power create big problems. You know, the ancient Egyptians thought of dreams as just a different kind of seeing. The Bible supports that view. How about you? There is power in dreams. Sometimes we let that power slip away from us when it's the power of God that wants to lead us through adversity, lead us through the test of attraction, and lead us through the ultimate test of authority. Genesis 41, 25 through 28. Read with me, would you? Both dreams... Wait, 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 wait stop right here. I realize I didn't set it up. Some of you may not realize uh, exactly where this is. Uh, Joseph, again, had been thrown in prison two years uh, somebody whose dream he'd interpreted, not the one that was killed, but the one that was restored to his place in Pharaoh's palace. Uh, Pharaoh's having these horrible dreams. He can't sleep. It's a recurring dream. He knows that it's supposed to mean something. He's in a culture that understands and, and reveres not only dreams, but people who can interpret them. So he's been given this report after all of his uh, you know, smart guys can't figure it out, that there's a guy in prison that probably can help. So they haul Joseph out of prison, standing before uh, the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and the king tells him his dreams. And you'll get the dream, even if you've never heard this story before, by Joseph's response to Pharaoh. Read it with me, would you? Both dreams mean the same thing. Joseph told Pharaoh, God was telling you, stop right there. Who's talking? Is he talking to a Christian? Is he talking to a Jew? So he's talking to a human being. God speaks to all people at all places at all times. The question is, are you open to hearing? The question is, are you open to interpreting what God is saying correctly? The greatest aid in interpreting God's dreams and visions is this book. And the stronger and the deeper and the more consistently you get God's word into you, the more strongly and consistent you can interpret what God is telling you through your visions and dreams of the preferred future. So God was telling you, let's finish that, what he is about to do. Wouldn't it be nice to know the bridge was out before you drive off the cliff? Wouldn't it be nice to know that God was saying, yeah, I know you love this gal, I know you love this guy, but that's not the one. That would empty out the divorce courts, what do you think? At least if Christians, all right? So God was telling you what he's about to do. God was showing you a slice of the future. Not in some fortune teller, astrological way. Don't worship the stars, worship the one who created the stars. God knows what makes this universe tick. God knows what ticks you off. So open your heart and mind, especially when your defenses are down, in those moments when we can dream whether it's a daydream or a deep slumber, rim sleep. God was telling you what he's about to do. Read it with me, would you? The seven fat cows and the seven plump heads of grain represent seven years of prosperity. Who likes prosperity? Woohoo! How many of you recognize that prosperity is not meant just for you? You know, there's a story in the Bible where uh, the man was very prosperous. He says, you know what I'll do? I'll build bigger barns. How did that turn out? Not too well. God says, your life is going to be forfeit tonight. He didn't kill him because he built barns. Good honk, there wouldn't be any Amish left on the planet. (laughs) But God knew that he was going to die. And in his death, everything that he thought he was saving for himself was going to be given away to somebody else anyway. So your prosperity, live it, love it, share it. I love the 10-10-80. Do you know what the 10-10-80 principle is? First 10% to God, second 10% to your future self, in other words, savings, and then live within your means within the 80%. So use your prospect. How many of you realize, if you haven't already retired, that one day you will retire? How many of you realize that people under the age of 40, on average, have less than $10,000 in savings? How long is that going to last in retirement? (laughs) Exactly. Okay, so we've got to plan. He is wise as serpent, but gentle as doves. We've got to plan. We've got to give 10% to God for his kingdom growth, 10% to our future self, because we're going to get to the future before we know it. God's already there for us, just as he was for Joseph. God is trying to lead us and to teach us and to guide us in prudent and wise living today so that we can live the balance of our life in God's way. 
And then he says, the seven thin, ugly cows. Wouldn't you hate to have that your description? I'm a thin, ugly cow. You know, you, yeah, you know, maybe you'd get a job for Chick-fil-A, you know, eat more chicken. I don't know. And it says the seven withered heads of grain represent what? Seven years of famine. No matter how good you got it today, some of you live by the principle, you're waiting for the other shoe, shoe to fall. Don't live with a pessimistic attitude. Live with an optimistic attitude, but a realistic attitude that says tomorrow is coming by the grace of God. Well, he properly interpreted The Pharaoh it had the ring of truth. He says, that's exactly what it is. And so he makes Joseph second in the kingdom only to himself, and he's been given power. Uh, who's got does a good Tim Allen? Oh. <laughs> you remember that lawnmower he had, that riding lawnmower? What did he do, put a V8 on it or something like that? You know, he's made, been second only to Pharaoh in one of the strongest nations on the planet. He's got more power than you and I could ever dream of. If you are going to be undone, Abraham Lincoln is right. Adversity won't do it, more than likely, but power, authority will undo you. So he, Joseph passed the test of adversity and passed the test of attraction, but now he was faced with the most difficult test for most of us, which is authority. You know what happened? That famine was real. And it not only encompassed Egypt, but all of the surrounding lands, including Canaan, where his family was. And so his brothers come to Egypt desperate for food. It had taken 23 years from the time that God gave Joseph the dream as a little arrogant boy to its fulfillment, where he's second only to Pharaoh. The immature dreamer grew up, and his family did bow down to him just as God revealed in his dreams. Here's the caveat. If your dreams do not honor God, if your dreams do not honor God's word and will, if your dreams somehow denigrate or dismiss other human beings, then you have misinterpreted your dreams. Go and find someone, someone who is connected to God, someone who has the blessing and the anointing of God, and tell them your dreams. Tell them, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Tell them and say, what do you think? And if they go to God's word, you went to the right interpreter. You have found your Joseph. Because God's word is a blueprint. It captures the way God gives us dreams. It captures the way God wants us to interpret our dreams. And they are never to harm other human beings. Don't become another Jim Jones. Don't convince people to drink your purple Kool-Aid. God is a God of life and love. God loves all of us. Genesis 50, 20, 21. Read it with me. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. Do you think Joseph interpreted the dream right finally? It wasn't about his father and brothers bowing down. Not to him, but about all of them bowing down to the God who loves us and provides for all of us. The cross of Calvary. Humanity intended it for harm. God intended it for a great good, a good that is now being done in our lives. So don't be afraid. We're on this side of the cross. We're on this side of the double cross of Joseph with his brothers. Let God give you his dream, for your life, for the life of this church, for the life of this nation and world. Don't be afraid. Join me in a word of prayer, would you? Father God, as we consider this story of Joseph, we're reminded that he is really a dress rehearsal for Jesus. Both had a special birth. Both were loved more by the father than their brothers. Both became good shepherds. Both were despised and rejected by their own. And both helped you save the Gentiles. 
not just the Egyptians, the people all around, including the Hebrew people, and not just then and there, but here and now. So Lord, help us to dream. Help us to have a new dream for our life, no matter how many days are left. Help us to have a dream that we can invest in not just secular activities, but in the sacred activity of the Church of Jesus Christ. Father, help us to do more than just pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to live into that dream, a dream where adversity and attraction and authority issues will come. But we trust that you, through Jesus Christ, will lead us through. And all of God's kids said, amen. Amen. Don't forget Marjorie out in the uh, cafe for your blood pressure check. I don't know about you, mine goes up about 20 points when I preach. (laughs) All right, let's stand and let's get that blood pressure up a little bit anyway. (laughs) Friend of God. Yeah.
come on up. We're going we're gonna to sing uh, Shalom one last time, and then we'll do it the last week in this series. So do you guys remember it? Good. Shalom, y'all. That's the, the Southern Judean version, y'all. Okay. <laughs> Last night and oh, we're glad we're, we got a home going. So hold on. Shalom. Peace out. <laughs> Have a beautiful day. Four o'clock grief share. Three more sessions in this round. All right. May your dreams be filled with heaven. I love that. <laughs>